Amen. All right, we're over there in 1 Kings chapter number 17. And uh, here in 1 Kings chapter number 17, uh, we have a very interesting character that's being introduced to us um, for the first time in the Bible. And this man is Elijah the Tishbite. Elijah the Tishbite, he was a great prophet who did a great many things uh, for God in his life. And we see here, let's start reading in verse number 1, 1 Kings 17, verse number 1. We'll see what the Bible has to say about this man named Elijah. Verse 1, 1 Kings 17, says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. So one thing you'll notice about Elijah in the Bible that I think is very interesting about him is obviously every prophet in the Bible and every man of God, is it's really his job to tell people when they're wrong. That's what the man of God's supposed to do. That's what his job is, and that's, that's what every man of God does. But one thing that's uh, distinct about Elijah is, is that he, he, sort of, uh, he sort of infamous or famous for just stopping people outright in their plans. And we're going to look at that this evening, but where you'll have a king, where you'll have people that are about to carry out a plan, that are about to think, they're about to get away with their plans, and Elijah sort of stops them in their tracks and says, not so fast. That's kind of uh, one thing that's interesting about Elijah um, that he does. So this evening, the title of the sermon is called when the man of God cancels your plans. When the man of God cancels your plans. And I just want to look at different responses people had. When Elijah did this, when he would stop people and say, hey, this is wrong, this is not what you should be doing, uh, God wants you to do this. Instead, how do people react? How do people react? Uh, how, do, how are we not supposed to react? And what's the proper response? So go ahead and turn to 1 Kings 16. We'll go ahead and get a little bit of context to the story. 1 Kings chapter 16, to see what we can learn uh, from Elijah this evening. Because this is something that um, applies to all of us. All of us have, uh, you know, men of God in our lives that are there to instruct us, that are there to, uh, we all have some sort of spiritual leader in our lives that's there to, to guide us and to, uh, uh, to help us. The Bible tells us that uh, he gave us, uh, uh, gave us teachers and, and, and pastors and things like this. So let's get the context of this story here. So the first thing this evening that we can learn from Elijah is when the man of God cancels your plans, don't ignore him. Don't ignore him. You're there in 1 Kings 16. Let's start reading verse 29. 1 Kings 16, 29 says, And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, here's another uh, man being introduced to us, began Ahab the son of Omri to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel and Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nabat, that he took his wife Jezebel the daughter of Abel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab, don't miss this, did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So here it mentions that Ahab, he was not, if you look at the entire history of Israel, he was not the worst king, but up to this point, there was no king that was as evil as he had been at this point in time. He was very evil. He rebelled against the Lord, did a lot of things um, that provoked the Lord God to anger, it says. So what does God do? So God chooses a prophet to announce his judgment, to cancel Ahab's plans, he chooses this man, Elijah the Tishbite. And you say, and that's of course what we're reading in, in 1 Kings 17. You say, did Ahab listen? No. You don't have to turn there, but uh, fast forward three years later, the Bible tells us in 1 Kings 18, 13, was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord and how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So here, three years later, He's still, him and his wife are still persecuting the prophets. They're still killing prophets. Um, they're still doing evil things. Ahab didn't listen. He ignored, he ignored the prophet. He ignored Elijah and what he said in 1 Kings 17. Turn to Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. So 
again, the first lesson, when the man God shows up and cancels our plans and tells us what the Bible says and tells us we're wrong, we should not ignore him. We should not ignore that advice. And this is, this is obviously a huge theme in the Bible because individuals and nations do this all the time with God. This is something that's very common. So let's see how, seri how serious this is, this is to God. Uh, you're there in Deuteronomy 17. Look at verse 6. This is God laying out the laws for his nation, the rules for his nation, how he wants them to deal with civil disputes, things like this. Verse 6, it says, At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But in the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people, so shalt thou put away evil from among you. So again, he's just telling them how to deal with crime, accusations, civil disputes, how to, how to deal with these things. In this case, he's saying when someone's accused of, of something that would, they would be, be put to death for, you can't just have one person accuse them of that. You can't just have one person say, hey, I saw him murder somebody, or I saw him do this. It has to be at least two or three witnesses. Verse 8, notice what he says here. He says, if there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment. He says, if you can't figure it out on your own, between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within thy gates, then shalt thou arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt come, in, come unto the priests, the Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days, and inquire, and they shall show thee the sentence of judgment. And thou shalt do according to the sentence which they of that place of the Lord shall choose, shall show thee, and thou shalt observe to do according to all they inform thee. So he's saying, I, if you can't figure it out, if it's too difficult, I want you to go to the Levites, and they will tell you what to do. And he takes it very seriously. Verse 11, according to the sentence of the law which they shall teach thee, and according to the judgment, judgment which they shall, shall tell thee, thou shalt do. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee to the right hand, nor to the left. So God is, is laying out that he has specifically picked the Levites, in this case, to tell them if there's, a, if there's a controversy that's too difficult that they can't figure out, God says, go to the Levites. You say, why the Levites? Well, they, they were the ones who knew God's law. They were the ones that knew how God wanted things done. And, God, and they were the ones who were appointed by God for this exact purpose. And he, ta he, he takes it very seriously. He says, And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest that stands to minister before the Lord thy God, or unto the judge, even that man shall die, and thou shalt put away evil from Israel. And this is nothing new. God is always, God does things differently, of course, in Old Testament and New Testament, but God has always appointed and used men for this purpose, to tell people his laws, to teach people his laws, to deal with their disputes, and to make judgment calls. That's something that God has always, it's a, it's, a, it's a structure God has always had in one form or another. And God wants us to listen to them. God, God wants us to use that tool we have. And you say, well, why is this so serious? I mean, in this case, they were literally put to death if they didn't listen. This is obviously civil disputes. But why so serious? The reason, I believe, is because there is, there's some extreme dangers of God's people ignoring the man of God, whether it's a prophet or a, a pastor in the New Testament, there are dangers to that. Turn to 2 Chronicles 25. 2 Chronicles 25. You don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 15.10 says, Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. So it's saying if you're someone who can't be corrected, and you, you can't stand reproof, you, you, you are going to, you're going to die. You're going to suffer consequences of your sin if you don't take correction. And then, of course, just the obvious fact that if you're forsaking the way, if someone's not doing what the Bible says, correction will be grievous unto them. Okay, they're in 2 Chronicles 25, and here we have a story of a man named Amaziah. And Amaziah, so far, had just won a great victory. God, God gave, he stepped out on faith, and God gave him this great victory over his enemies. And here, look what he does as he wins this battle, as he, as he wins this victory that God gave him. 2 Chronicles 25, 14. Now it came to pass, after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, so he just, God just gave him this victory. It says that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods and bowed down himself before them and burned incense unto them. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah and he sent unto him a prophet 
Notice what the prophet says. Which said unto him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? He's saying, What are you doing, Amaziah? These gods, these false gods, they weren't able to deliver their people. Now why are you going to them? And this, this isn't what the sermon's about this evening, but this is very true, right? A lot of times Christians will run to worldly things that don't even profit the people in the world. If you, you, know, you see people running to things of the world, like the worldly music or the worldly influences or worldly friends, or they do things the world does, worldly, uh, worldly entertainment, and you'll see Christians adopt these things that couldn't deliver the people of the world from them. It didn't benefit the people in the world, yet Christians are running to those same things. Just kind of interesting. And it came to pass, as he talked with him, notice what Amaziah says, that the king said unto him, Art thou made of the king's counsel forbear? Why shouldest thou be smitten? He's saying, I, I didn't, I, you're not my counsel. You're, this isn't your job to tell me what to do. I don't want to hear it. Then the prophet forbear and said, again, just notice the strong language, I know that God hath determined to destroy thee. Why? Because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. The word determined means decided or resolved. And this prophet is telling Amaziah, he's saying, you know what, Amaziah, God has resolved, God has decided to destroy you because you didn't listen to the, the counsel of the prophet. That's, that's a serious thing. And you see, so why do people do it? Right? Why do we do it? When, when we're corrected by the man of God, why is it, what, what causes us to not, to, to not regard it or not think that it's what we should do I think the Bible points to that it's two main things. It's arrogance and it's unthankfulness it are the two main things. You don't have to turn there, but Nehemiah 9.16 says, But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks, and hearkened not to thy commandments, and refused to obey, neither were they mindful of the wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou wert a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and forsookest them not. So here Nehemiah is praying to God and he's looking back on Israel's history and he's saying they hardened their necks, they didn't hearken because one, they weren't mindful of the things God did for them and two, they were just lifted up with pride. Are the two reasons that he gives there. They're prideful and unthankful. Turn to 1 Kings 12. 1 Kings 12. You don't have to turn there, but while you're going to 1 Kings, Proverbs 19.20 says, Hear counsel and receive instruction, that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart, nevertheless the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. You say, why do I need, you say, I'm saved, I have the Holy Spirit, and I have the Bible, why do I need a man of God? Why can't I just sit down with the Holy Spirit and the Bible and... That's all I need. Well, obviously, as, as believers, we have the ability to read the Bible and to learn things from the Bible, of course. But the reason that we need and the reason that God's people has, have always had some sort of man of God to know his laws and to, te to, to be there to advise them is because one thing that we're good at as people, one thing we think we're good at as people, is we're very good at, at justifying our decisions, justifying or spiritualizing our decisions. So we'll sit there and we'll read the Bible and what we will do is we will we'll want something, we'll have our mind made up that this is what I want, this is what I'm going to do. And we can curve the Bible in our own minds to match what we want. We can sit there and we can stuff the Bible. And we can, it's like taking a puzzle piece that it's in the wrong spot and just forcing it in. You can do it. You can put it where it doesn't belong, but it's not going to work out for you. And this is what we do as people. So because of that, because we're sinners, and you see the Bible is perfect, but we're not. Right? The Bible is perfect, but us, we, we can use our own, de our own deceitful heart and, and, uh, and twist it for our own benefit. Right? The people do it with false doctrine all the time. So what we need as people is we need, because uh, here's the thing, you'll tell yourself what you want to hear. Your friends may tell you what you want to hear. So we need an unbiased third party who knows the laws of God and is looking at the situation from the outside in to advise us. That's what we need because... If not, we're very good at just trying to force our own way um, uh, you know, on God, spiritualize our decisions or, or justify our decisions. Um, th that's why we need a pastor. That's why we need a man of God in our lives. There in 1 Kings 12, the Bible says this. This is talking about uh, the son of Solomon, Rehoboam. 
It says in verse 1, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. Skip down to verse 3. We'll, we'll just kind of try to skip through this. Verse 3, And they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came, and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father, talking about Solomon, made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father in his heavy yoke, which he put on us, lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, and then come again to me. And the people departed. So Rehoboam, Solomon's son, is about to be kinged here. He's about to become the new king. And the people make a request to him. They say, Hey, your father taxed us a lot. He made a, a, our work grievous. He, 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 put, he was uh, very hard on us. If, if you make it lighter, we'll serve you. We'll, we'll respect you, and we will serve you. And, and Rehoboam says, Okay, come back in three days. I'll think about it, is, is basically what he tells them. Verse 6, And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? So, so far, so good. He's going, think about these men. He's going to the men that were advisors to the wisest man who ever lived, which is interesting to note that the wisest man who ever lived was smart enough to know that even he needed advisors. Um, so he goes to these men. In verse 7, it says, And they spake unto him, saying, and this is very good advice that they give him. If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day and wilt serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. So they're giving very good advice here. They're saying, hey, you treat them well, they will treat you well. Verse 8, but he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. So instead he goes with his friend's advice. Uh, skip down to verse 12, which of course... They just tell Rehoboam what he wants to hear. Their buddy's the king, and they just tell him what they know he is looking to hear. Verse 12, So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come again to me the third day. And the king answered the people roughly. So this is what he's doing what his friends told him to do. And forsook the old men's counsel, which they gave him, and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy. I will add to your yoke. My father also ch chastised you with whips, and I will chastise you with scorpions. And we're not going to read the rest, but of course, this is the people. The people, they're like, that's not what we want. So of course, the people, this is how the nation splits. This is how the kingdom split into two different kingdoms, because he didn't follow the, the advice that was there for him in his lifetime. So just a lesson here. When the man of God uh, 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 cancels our plans and stops maybe our ambition, or what we are planning on doing, we ought, to, we, we ought not to ignore that. We ought to listen to that and take heed to that for our own benefit. Yeah. Proverbs 28, 9 just says this. You don't have to turn there. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. God's saying, I'm not even going to hear your prayer if you don't listen to, to the law that I've given. God says, I've given you people to teach you the law. So if you're going to ignore them, I'm not going to hear I'm not going to hear your prayer. It's a very serious thing. I mean, God is, it's a tool God has given us that we definitely should use in our lives. Amen. Turn to 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18. So we're going to look at these three things this evening, and we, we notice, we'll, you'll notice that they kind of get worse, right? Uh, the first thing is when the, we, we just looked at, when the man of God cancels your plans, don't ignore him. Well, here's what some people do. Some people will ignore, and here's what they do next. The second this evening is this. Uh, go back to 1 Kings 18, of course. When the man of God cancels your plans, don't blame him. Don't blame him. 1 Kings 18, let's fast forward three years. Again, the land's in a famine because of the sins of Ahab. Whose fault is it? It's Ahab's. Ahab sinned, and because of Ahab's sin, God said, I'm sending a famine on the land. And Ahab knows this. Elijah told him that. So he, Ahab is well aware of this. So three years later, Ahab is still unrepentant. Verse 1, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab, so now we're, gonna, now we're looking from Ahab's perspective here. So here we see Ahab um, cooking up another plan here. He has another plan of how he's going to try to fix his sin without getting right. So, and Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. 
And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go in the land, unto all the fountains of water, into all the brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose all the beasts. So is he going to get right? Nope. Instead, he's going to uh, try to fix it his own way. He tells this guy who works for him, he's like, okay, here's the plan. We're going to try to find some water, some grass, so the animals don't die. He basically tells him, you go this way and look for, for water, I'll go this way. Verse 6, so they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face and said, Art thou that, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Notice what he tells this man, Obadiah. Go, tell thy lord, behold, Elijah is here. He says, go back to Ahab, who's trying to carry out this plan, and I want you to tell him, Elijah is here. Again, just canceling, there to cancel the plan. Skip to verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, now what, what would you do if God, if God had, to, if, if had told you, you had, God had warned you and said, hey, say a man of God or, or someone had told you in your life, hey, if you do this, your life's going to get worse. It's going to be terrible for you. I, God's going to punish you if you go down this road. Say you ignored it, you did it anyway, and say you've just been through three years of, of, of just punishment from God. You're suffering under the punishment of God, and you see this prophet again. What would you tell him? You'd probably be a lot humble. You'd probably tell him, uh, you'd probably be much more humble than say, I'm sorry, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get right. What does Ahab say? And Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? You say, really? Really? He's been going, the whole nation's in this turmoil, in this horrible time. People are starving because of Ahab's decision. And here he sees the man of God for the first time in three years, and he says, it's your fault. It's your fault that this is happening. You're the one who's troubling Israel. You say, how is this Elijah's fault? But this is what people do. This is what people do when they're in sin, and they don't want to admit. You see, a lot of people, they may ignore the man of God, but then things get worse for them, and they get off, that train, they get off the train at that point. Some people stay on the train. Some people stay in the train, and they get to the point where they start blaming other people. They don't want to deal with it themselves and admit fault, so they blame other people. Verse 18, And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and that thou hast followed Balaam. So again, when the man of God cancels your plans, don't just not ignore him, but don't blame him either. Don't blame him for your problems. Turn to Psalm 32. And this isn't even about the man of God. I mean, obviously it is, but it's also just about other people. People like to, to, to blame anybody else. It's like when you're suffering the consequences of your sin, it's like having a, this giant box you're trying to carry, and people just want to throw that box into somebody else. You're carrying it. It's your thing. You created the problem for yourself, but people just want to throw it on the man of God or throw it on their friends, throw it on those anyone they can blame, anyone who can take that burden off of them. But look, another major theme in the Bible is, look, we need to acknowledge our own sin. When we mess up and we make mistakes, which we all will, we need to acknowledge our sins as, as quickly as possible. You're there in Psalm 32. Look at verse 2. Psalm 32, 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through the roaring all, my day, all the day long. So here the author is saying, talking about when it's difficult for him, because of a, of a mistake he made, uh, verse 4, for Day and night thy hand, he's talking to God, was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Verse 5, so what did he do about it? I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And then that kind of goes back to verse 1, where he starts off saying, you know, it's a great thing to have your sins forgiven. It's a great thing to acknowledge your sin and to have it dealt with. And so that, that's, what, he, that's what, the, what he's illustrating that we should do here. Because look, God wants to forgive you. Obviously, as believers, we're all forgiven in the sense that we'll never go to hell for our sin. But just in our lives, God wants to forgive you of your sin and move on. God's not, God doesn't punish you just to punish you. God punishes you because that's the whole point of chastisement. That's the whole point of the famines. Is it's God's 
punishing us so that we can correct ourselves and, and move on. Amen. We don't have to deal with it anymore. We can go back to serving him and doing great things. That's the whole point. Amen. Turn to 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. Here's another example of someone who blamed other people and dealt with some pretty serious consequences because of it. 1 Samuel 15, look at verse 19. Here this is talking about Saul. Saul was told uh, to go kill the Amalekites to wipe them out. He, God said, don't keep any, anything alive, nothing that breathes. I want you to, to kill everything and everyone. And Saul didn't do that. Saul kept the best of the, of the animals. He didn't kill the king. And here Samuel the prophet is rebuking Saul for this. He says in verse 19, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took of the spoil and sheep, and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. So he confronts Saul and says, Saul, that's not what God told you to do. You were supposed to kill the animals. You were supposed to ki kill Agag. And here Saul blames it on the people. He, he blames it on other people. He says, no, it wasn't me. They did it. Which is interesting because even if, I, I don't know, but let, let's say they did. Let's say it was the people that just didn't listen and went and did it anyway. Saul's the leader, so he still bore the responsibility for what happened there. Right. Saul, Saul was the one who was commissioned by God to take care of it. If it didn't go, if, if it didn't go the way God wanted, that's on him, not the people. Verse 26, And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. And, and notice the, the consequence here. And the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. So notice here, of course, Saul is saved, so he's not saying God's rejected you or your soul or, you know, you, your salvation. He's saying God has rejected thee from being king. God's, God basically permanently removed him from the position he, he previously gave him. Turn to Exodus 32. I mean, that's a pretty serious consequence. And it's interesting because Saul will go on in his life to do way worse things. Saul will go on in his life, you'll, you'll read, to commit murder, to to commit, uh, to, to, tr to do much more evil things than he did here. But it, when the Bible talks, in the, as the Bible goes on and tells Saul's story, and it explains why he was rejected from being king, it was, it's still this story that was being referenced. Which is interesting is, even in when you read the Kings and Chronicles, God's always very consistent like that. If you have a king that does a bunch of evil, it's always one specific thing that God said, this is why I killed him. This is why... Um, this is why he died. He died for this decision or, or, or whatever. God's always very consistent like that. Um, you don't have to turn there, but Hosea 14.1, uh, you should be in Exodus 32, but Hosea, the kind of the theme of Hosea 13 and 14 is, is God is reiterating. Israel must have been blaming other people for their sin because in Hosea, the theme is that God is, is, is kind of rebuking them for blaming other people. And he's, he's reiterating, no, Israel, it's because of your fault. It's your sin that, you, that got you into this mess. Hosea 14, 1 and 2 says, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. It's your fault. It's your sin. Verse 2, take with you words and turn to the Lord and say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. So God's saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you just to admit that it's your iniquity that caused this, your sin. And I want you to ask for forgiveness. Ask me to take away your sin. And we can go forward from there. That's what God wants from us. And it's a, for whether it's a nation, whether it's a believer, whether it's a lost soul, it's a major theme in the Bible that the first step uh, to getting right is acknowledging your sin. Amen. Think about even with when we go soul winning, right? What's the first thing that people have to understand? What's the first thing that we cannot move on until they get? They have to acknowledge their sin and the punishment that they deserve for it. Right. We can't move on. If we go and we, we tell someone, hey, uh, do you believe you're a sinner? And do you believe you deserve hell? And if they, if they refuse to believe that, they can't get saved. Right. They, we can't move on from there. The first step of even salvation is admitting, the, is acknowledging where your sin has got you. So, and, and it's the same theme with, with anybody else. Exodus 32, this is almost, uh, 
This is almost a humorous story here, Exodus 32, where Moses goes up to receive the first copy on Mount Sinai of the Ten Commandments. And of course, the people built the golden calf. And Aaron, Aaron, uh, Moses' brother, was the one who, who actually carried this out. He's the one who forged it. He's the one who made it. And Moses comes down from the mountain and he sees this and he's infuriated. And this is when he casts the, the copies down and he breaks them. And look what, look what Moses does here, Exodus 32, 20. And he took the calf which they had made. Think about how long this took Moses. Think about how, there's only one verse, but I'm sure this took him a lot of time. Exodus 20, and he took the calf, Exodus 32, 20, he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink it. So he takes it, he melts it back down, he, burnt, he chops it up and, and he, he beats it into small pieces, he grinds it into powder into powder, he, he's, he dumps it in the water and he makes the people of Israel drink the water of, of scattered, scattered with the gold they, they had made this idol out of. Pretty, pretty intense. And then the blame game starts. So now, now he dealt with it. Now he, 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 he dealt with, he punished them for it. Now Moses is figuring out who did this, whose fault is it. Verse 21, And Moses said unto Aaron, So obviously, I highly doubt that Moses came down and Aaron came running up to Moses saying, hey, I'm the one who did this. As Moses is grinding this to powder, I doubt Aaron was like, I'm the one who did that, just so you know. That was my idea. I th obviously, it was the people who, who probably pointed out that Aaron, oh, no, he's the one who did it. So the people blame Aaron. And Moses said unto Aaron, what did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. No, notice the people that they are set on mischief. So the people blame Aaron. Then Aaron blames the people. He says to Moses, you know how they are. You know they're always, they're, they're always up to something, even though he was the one who actually did it. For they said unto me, this is Aaron talking, make us gods which shall go before us. For as this Moses, so then again, the people blame Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We wot not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me, and I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. So he tells them, for, for a random reason totally unrelated to the intent of making an idol, I asked them to give me all their gold. Not to make an idol, I just asked them to do that. I had them give me all their gold, and then I melted the gold, and I put it in the fire, not to make an idol, they just I don't know, I just decided to do that. And then this calf just popped out of the fire. And you laugh at that, but here's the thing. You say, that's ridiculous. That sounds so silly. Look, that's how we sound when we're making excuses for our sin. Yeah, right. We do the same thing. We go to the man of God, and here's the thing. We think we're really good at it. We think we're really good at making excuses, but we're not. All it takes is anybody, whether it's a pastor or a brother in Christ, sister in Christ, to look at it from the outside in, unbiased, and be like, what are you talking about? What are you doing? Because this is what we do. We, we say, I, I don't know. I, this wasn't my fault. I just, I, just, uh, I just did this, and it just happened. I don't know. I was told not to, you know, and, and people refused to take the blame. So I think that's why this story is in the Bible, because we, we kind of laugh at this, and we say, that's ridiculous, and, and we chuckle at it. But that's the point. This is how we sound to the Moseses of our lives when we're making excuses for our sin and trying to blame other people. So I, I believe the story is, is very intentional, as funny as it may be. So don't blame the man of God. I mean, this story is just, people are blaming people left and right. The people blame Moses, then, then they blame Aaron when they actually do the sin, then Aaron blames the people, and then Aaron blames the fire. It's ridiculous. So look, if, if you've already gone, if you've already taken the, the train of sins to the, to the point where you've already ignored the advice, and look, deal with it then. Don't keep blaming people. Don't start doing that. Just deal with it and get right and, and move on from there. Because here's the thing. What it shows everybody else is it shows when you, when you blame other people, you blame the man of God, everybody knows what you're doing. So all it does for you is it shows how poor your character is. It makes you look like a fool. Is it, you know, look, look, at, look at Aaron here. I mean, this, this made him look like, like a fool just, just from him thinking that other people would believe this. And ultimately, it just makes your, your sin problem worse. It's just the worst way to deal with your sin. So let's make sure that not only when the man of God cancels our plans, right? We're going forward with plans that we're trying to justify, we're trying to move forward with. 
When the man of God steps in the way and says, hey, hey, don't do that. This isn't good for you. This, this isn't what God wants for your life. Don't ignore him. But even more, even more so than that, don't blame him. Don't start blaming other people for your sin. The second that you can acknowledge your own sin is the second you can start fixing the problems that your sin has created. So third tonight, and this is probably the, 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 the biggest one, but when, when you're on the train of your sinful plans and you get at the stop of, of, of ignoring the man of God and you, you ignore him, you stay in the train and you start blaming him, what can people do next? Well, the next thing is when the man of God cancels your plans, don't attack him. Don't attack him. That's, that's, what, that, that's another thing that people can do. Turn to 2 Kings 1. 2 Kings 1. So we're kind of fast forwarding here many years. Ahab has died, and now his son Ahaziah is the king. So basically, 1 Kings ends with the death of Ahab, and it begins with the reign of his son. That's kind of the divider there. So 2 Kings, let's just start reading the book in verse 1. So Ahab has just died, verse 1. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Verse 2. And Ahaziah, again his son, fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. So more plans, right? Here Ahaziah, probably not much worse or not much better than Ahab, is he, he, he gets injured, he's sick, and he tells, he, his plan is he tells his messengers, he says, okay, go to Ekron, and I want you to ask the devil for advice. Ask the devil, ask Baal if I'm going to recover of this disease. So what does God do? He, ha, he gets his plan canceller to cancel his plans. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Rise, and go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that ye go to inquire Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? By the way, I think it's also interesting that the prophets always outlive the kings. You'll have the, the, if you have a series of evil kings, you'll have like one prophet that, that lived during the reign of like five kings. Just kind of interesting that works out. Um, sin kills. Uh, so, so he goes and he tells Elijah, Go to his messengers, literally stop them on their journey, and tell them, and, and rebuke them for this. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. So he walks up to him, he stops him, says, You're doing this because you're backslidden, you've rebelled against God, and by the way, you're going to die. And he just leaves. And when the messengers turn back unto him, they go back to Ahaziah, he said unto them, why are ye now turned back? He's like, why are you back so soon? And they said unto him, There came a man to meet us, and said unto us, Go turn again to the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, is it not because there is not a God in Israel? And they, they tell him what Elijah said. Verse 7, and I think it's interesting. I think Ahaziah knew exactly who this was, because we see him ask this really vague question, to, to just to kind of like he thought he knew who it was, but he's like, okay, just to be sure, I'm going to ask this question. And he said unto them, what manner of man was he, which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was a hairy man, and girt, uh, girt with the girdle of leather but his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. He knew exactly who it was. He asked them this vague question of, Oh, what was he dressed like? What, was he look, what did he look like? And they tell him, and he's like, I knew it. It was Elijah. Ah! Again, canceling people's plans. So how does he respond? Maybe he'll get it better. Maybe Ahab uh, was a little worse than this. Second Kings 1 Verse chap, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 9, and Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty. And he went up to the, him, and, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill. And he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. So he sends soldiers. This isn't to reward Elijah. This isn't to thank Elijah for the spiritual advice. He's sending a literal army, a little company against him to harm him and to basically take him prisoner, uh, take him prisoner. And you say, that's terrible. But look, people do this. This is how people respond when sometimes when, when the man of God in their life cancels their plans. Turn to Second Chronicles 24. Second Chronicles 24. And this isn't new. You know, men of God are always uh, suffering for, for the message that they bring. Jeremiah 15, 15 says, O Lord, thou knowest, 
Remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. This is Jeremiah talking. So this isn't anything new. Men of God are always suffering rebuke for the message that they carry. But look, especially as a belie- saved believer, you don't want to have anything to do with that. You don't want to have anything. Leave that to the world. Leave the persecution of the man of God to the world. Second Chronicles 24, so this is during Josiah's, or not Josiah, um, Joash's reign. So jo- Joash was seven years old when he began to reign. And if you remember, um, Jehoiada the priest kind of, um, kind of taught him and was there for him to teach him the laws of God. And as soon as jo- Jehoiada died, then, then Joash kind of went downhill from there. Verse 18, this is after the death of Jehoiada the priest. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Yet, what does God do? Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again to the Lord. Because look, that's what God wants. God, God ultimately, he just wants us to get right. That's what God is looking for. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord and testified against them, but they would not hear. They refused to listen. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, which which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because look, especially as a believer, if you are transgressing against the commandments of the Lord, you cannot prosper. It will not work for you. Just as a blanket statement. Because you have forsaken the Lord, notice this, he, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. So he rebukes the nation, specifically the king, and the king gives the order to take his life, to kill him. Look, this isn't anything new. Even people who, uh, uh, who are saved can respond if they refuse to get off the train and they keep going deeper and deeper into their sin. Look, don't let yourself get to the point where not, you, not only are you ignoring the men of God in your life, not only are you blaming them, but to where, God forbid, you actually start attacking them. God forbid. And you, look, you say, why do people do this? Why, why do people go to such extents where they actually start attacking the men of God? Is it because they hate him personally? Is it because they hate, uh, they hate him as, as a man? Or do they hate his words? Is it that they hate his advice? They hate what he's telling them. They hate... They hate the, the commandments. Because here's the thing. A lot of times when people are trying to justify their decisions like we, like we do, and we're trying to spiritualize their decisions, we don't want to come out and say, I disagree with the Bible. I disagree with what God wants for my life. No, they, they're blaming it, and they put it off on the man of God and say, no, it's his fault. It's him. He's the one who should be attacked. And this isn't anything new either. Jesus said in, in John 15, 18, he said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So this is anything new. Jesus is saying, they just hate you because they hate me. And I'm the one who told you what to say. I'm the one who commissioned you. So it's not you they hate. It's me. And they hated me long before they hated you. They don't hate the prophet. They hate the message of the one behind him if that makes sense. So look, the bottom line and, and the biggest reason you don't want to be a part of this as a, as a Christian is look, God avenges his prophets, his messengers. God, is, God has their back. Few things, if you just read the Bible, just a general thing about if you read Revelation, if you read the prophets, there are few things in the Bible that will bring the wrath of God more fiercer and faster than the harm of innocent people and his men, his prophets. It's not something we want to be a part of, trust me. Just own your sin. Don't, don't let yourself get to that point. I mean, do you really want to be involved in that? Do you really, I mean, obviously, um, you know, the world killing Christians and, and martyrs, that's a whole other thing. But do you really want to be involved in the attacks of, God, of, of, of people, of, of, of soul-winning Christians, soul-winning pastors, to any extent? We don't. Turn to 2 Kings 1. 2 Kings 1. We'll continue this story. 2 Kings 1, verse 10, we'll continue. It says, And Elijah answered and said, so again, Ahaziah sent this company to harm Elijah. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. 
And there came down fire from heaven. Look, God has his back. God's on his side. And consumed him and his 50. Also, again also. So he tried it again. Again also, he sent unto him another captain of 50 with his 50. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again, tries it a third time. Tries it, he won't get right. Tries it again. And he sent again a captain of the fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him. And said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came down fire from heaven, and burnt up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. Look, just as a side note here, some sins are so bad that you'll be destroyed even if you're just in the presence of it. Even if you're just the soldier that's in the captain of 50, you may not be the one who made the decision or whatever, who, who is currently carrying it out, but look, God, you know, you'll be harmed in those sins as well. But God tells him, he says, I will protect you, just go ahead and go with him. Look, it's no, it's no, it's no joke. It, it, it's no joke. Think about Saul. Saul literally had 85 priests murdered. 85 priests and their families murdered. How did that turn out for him? Obviously, he lost the kingdom for, for the one instant we already read about. But how did that turn out for him? First Chronicles 10.13 says, So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. Saul died. Saul was so wicked, God eventually took his life on this earth because of it. Look, it's no joke. Look, you don't have to agree with the man of God. Look, if you want to ignore him, go on and make mistakes and ruin your life, so be it. But look, when you decide to cross the line of attacking him, you're playing baseball with a grenade, my friend. You're just asking for trouble. Because here's the thing. Let's say that you're right. Let's say you're right, and let's say that um, you, you are given you know, wrong advice. Just, just for a second, let's just pretend that you're being given wrong advice or something. If, even if you are right in that area, but you decide to go attacking the man of God, God still has his back. Because that is not something that we, we should never have an excuse for doing that to a soul-winning man of God, a soul-winning, uh, a Bible-preaching man of God, especially our own, especially the one that God's given us in our lives, whether it's just a spiritual leader or a pastor or whatever it is. Turn to 1 Kings 21. So we talked about the wrong responses, right? Don't ignore the man of God. When he cancels your plans, don't ignore him, don't blame him, especially don't attack him. But what's the right response? How should we respond, right? That's not... It's kind of like soul winning, right? We tell people, okay, here's what salvation is not. It's not working your way to heaven. It's not, you know, uh, uh, thinking that your works, you have to keep up your works to stay saved. It's not being baptized. It's not repenting your sins. But then we tell people what it is, right? Say, okay, here's the right salvation, though. It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at the right response. So this is back in the reign of Ahab when, when he was king. And, of course, this is the story where Ahab wanted, there's this vineyard that was next to Ahab's house. It was owned by a man named Naboth. And Ahab wanted the vineyard, and he went to Naboth and said, I'll give you money for the vineyard, sell me the vineyard. And Naboth said, it's not for sale. It's not for sale. He wouldn't sell it, so eventually, Ahab, w together with his wife, conspired to kill him. They, they took Naboth, and they had false witnesses accuse him, and he was murdered. They murdered this man just to take his, his property. So, Verse 16, uh, 1 Kings 21, 16. And it came to pass, so it's all over, Naboth is dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard and Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Here he is with more plans. I, I imagine him, I, I, you know, I kind of try to set the scene in my head here. It's, Naboth is dead. There's probably no one in this vineyard. And Ahab's walking in the vineyard. Maybe he's admiring it. He's gloating in the fact that he, he got away with it, right? He did it. He got away with murder. Now the vineyard's his. He's literally on his way to sign the title. He's on his way to take possession of it. He's in this vineyard. He's probably alone. But then again, the man of God has been commissioned to cancel his plans. Verse 17, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Arise, 
Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the, Na the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And then God tells him here ahead of time what he's going to say. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall the dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And so I picture, I picture Ahab here. He's in this vineyard, and he sees Elijah there. He sees him again for the third time in his life there to cancel his plans. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? He said, You got me again. You found me again. And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. So as we go in and we read this, we're going to see Ahab was so bad, we're going to see Elijah give a curse to Ahab that is so serious it was only given to three people in the Bible. He basically, there's this curse where he tells him, it was given to, to, to three people in the Bible that God is going to kill you and he's going to wipe out your entire family because of your sin. That's how bad Ahab was. And I want you to picture being Ahab. Picture hearing this. As he goes on, he goes into this, this curse. Picture him hearing this. Verse 21. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. He said, your whole family is going to die. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, like the house of Basha, king of Ahijah. Those are two people before him that were cursed with this. For the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger, and made Israel to sin. And if Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. And then he tells them, In the same place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, who you killed, they're going to lick your blood when I kill you. And let's see what, how he responds. It's kind of unexpected. Verse 27. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard these words, notice this, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And you say, oh, those are just crocodile tears. He's just feigning it. Look, God recognizes it. God sees him humble himself. And God, God looks at that and says, I recognize that. Verse 28, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself? See, again, it's all due to pride. How Ahab humbleth himself before me. Because he hath humbled himself before me, look what God says, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's day, days will I bring the evil upon his house. God says, you know, he's gone too far. I can't, I can't completely forgive it. But since he's humbled himself and he's, 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 he's uh, you know, fasting and he's going softly, he says, because of it, I will bring this curse out in his son's days. Now, Ahab did eventually die because of other sins he committed later. But God promises that I will not execute this curse until he is dead. I will do it in his son's days. Turn to 2 Chronicles 12. You know, this is a promise that God has in the Bible. God promises that especially with his people, with Israel, if they, if they turn from their sin, God says, I will recognize that. You don't have to turn there, but in 2 Chronicles 7, God tells Solomon, uh, God tells Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7, 13, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, he's saying, if their sin gets so bad, I actually have to punish them for it, and I have to ruin their land. God says this, he says, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. God promises, he says, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God leaves the door open here. He says, even if I'm in they're in punishment and they're in judgment, he says, if they come, they, they ask for forgiveness and they humble themselves, he says, I will, I'll hear that. I'll hear that. May, you know, maybe I won't be able to, you know, uh, you know, remove the punishment, but I'll, I will forgive them for that. I will, I will move past that. And then in 2 Chronicles 12, this is with Rehoboam, later in Rehoboam's life, when he turns against God. 2 Chronicles 12, 5, Then came Shemaiah the prophet, so here's a man of God to cancel some plans, to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak 
is said unto them. So Rehoboam's in trouble. He's rebelled against God. He's being judged. And God has sent this army against him to punish him. And notice what he says. The prophet says to him, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me. And therefore, he says, Because of that, have I also left you in the hand of, of Shishak. God says, I've left you in the hands of this army because of your sin. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. They got right. They, they, they humbled themselves. And notice, And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves. Therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. My wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Well, some people, they stay on this train of their sin to the very end. They, they go down, they ignore advice, they blame people, maybe they even attack people, the man of God who are giving them advice. But look, you, look at Ahab. You can get right at the 11th hour. It's, I mean, it's possible. I mean, can you do it? Yes. Will God forgive you? Yes. Will he spare you from the punishment and judgment? Maybe. Look, you can do it. But look, wouldn't it, wouldn't it just be better to have listened in the first place? Amen. Wouldn't it have just been better, Ahab, to listen the first time Elijah walked up to you? Instead of waiting till he came up to you in a vineyard of someone you had murdered after you had been murdering and killing prophets for many years? Wouldn't, wouldn't it have just been better to do it in the first place? Turn to Zechariah 7, 8. Look, it's better to apologize, it's better to apologize for playing with the match than after you've already burned down the building. It's better to have the man of God come up to you and say, hey, hey, you shouldn't do that. Put that out. Don't put the, put the, put the lighter away. Put the, fire, put the match away. Then to wait till you've ignored him, destroyed your life, and your, your life is on fire, it's burned down, and you're like, okay, fine, fine, fine. I'm sorry. Look, you can do that, and God will forgive you as a Christian. Obviously, you know, we'll always be saved, and, and our sins will never catch up to us. They're, they're as far as the east is from the west. And God will forgive you. But look, that doesn't mean that the consequences of your sin are just going to disappear. It, it should be a warning to us. It should be a warning to us. You're there in Zechariah 8. We'll finish here. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Zechariah 7, 8, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. So Zechariah, this is after the captivity, they've come back. And Zechariah is preaching to them, and he's, he's looking back on how they did react. He's looking back on Israel's past, and how they used to listen. And so he, he's kind of giving them this history. Verse 11, but they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. I think it's interesting, by the way, when the Old Testament will mention something that like in the New Testament, his people, the, the Pharisees, the Jews, did the exact same thing, right? Here he mentions they stopped their ears. Well, in the New Testament, think about, uh, we just read this, uh, we just uh, went through the story of, uh, um, of in Acts chapter uh, 7 with Stephen. How, what do they do? They stop their ears. You know, also in Amos, you know, how God says, um, for the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of my house. Sure enough, Jesus came and, you know, in, later in time and literally drove them out of his house. So this is God's being literal here. He's talking about how they literally responded to men of God in the past and the future. But they refused to hearken. Verse 12, yea, they made their hearts. Look, this is how we are as people sometimes. They made their hearts as an adamant stone lest they should hear the law in the words which the Lord of hosts hath sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. And then notice this verse here. So he's saying they wouldn't listen, they refused to listen, they stopped their ears, they, they, they made their heart, they hardened their hearts, anything to not listen to the man of God they had available. Look what God says for this. He says, therefore it has come to pass, that is, he cried, as the prophet cried, he cried here being he yelled, he preached, as he cried, begging them, begging them to turn to God, and begging them to listen, as he cried, and they would not hear. So they cried, look what God says, he says, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. Here God's saying, and this is a, this is a, um, 
This is a, a, a sombering verse, especially when you think about it applied to unsaved people. People, you know, we go to soul winners and we cry to people, we beg them to get saved. And God says, in the same way that my prophets, my soul winners, and my men of God cried and begged people to get saved, in the same time, they will cry to me and I will not hear. But look, as Christians, this applies to us too. Because look, there's men of God, look, we all make mistakes, we're all sinners. And so as long as we are still sinners, we will have men of God correcting us in our lives guaranteed. And look, in the same way God's saying is, is the men of God who I've given you are crying unto you and begging you to get right and begging you not to go down the wrong roads. He said, if you ignore them, look, God will forgive you even if you wait till the 11th hour. But God says, if you don't get right, he says, when, your house, when the house is burnt down and your life's a train wreck and it's all gone south, he says, you're going to cry to me. He said, I will not hear. And look, God forbid that that becomes us. God forbid that we take the, the counsel that we've been given in our lives and the advice in our lives and we put it off so much that when we're in trouble, yeah, sure, we can humble ourselves. We can get right, and, and that's what God wants ultimately. But to where our, uh, we, we've made such a mess of our lives that God says, you know, your prayer is an abomination at this point. Just like that verse we read in Proverbs, right? I will no longer hear. So look, God forbid God refuses to hear us because we refuse to hear his men. Let's use this tool that we have. When, look, when the man of God cancels our plans, let's, let's search the scriptures. Let's, let's see uh, whether those things are so. Like the disciples in, in Berea, how they weren't like those in Thessalonica. Why? Because unlike those in Thessalonica, when they heard the preaching, they searched the scriptures. Look, when we get advice, when our plans are canceled, we need, to, we need to look at ourselves and be like, I guess I was doing the wrong thing, or I guess I need to pray about this. I need to read the Bible about this. We need to use that tool that God has had because, look, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely imperative. The man of God is, is there to, give a, to do something for us that sometimes we, can, we can't do for ourselves, which is, which is uh, be able to have an unbiased view of what God wants for us in our lives. So, look, let's use that. Let's avoid the dangers of refusing to listen to spiritual leaders and men of God in our lives. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.